All right, so. So we got Germany surrendering. They're meeting in Paris. And Germany is going to be, what did, what did they keep going? The Allies kept going for six months until they signed the treaty. Yeah, that starvation blockade, which you can imagine the feeling after that. So I think we got right to here, the reparations. Is this, is this right for everybody? And so the reparations, this was designed so Germany could not partially to pay for the damage, but also to make sure they can't do it again. You know, that was the French goal. And so this treaty, all the different elements of it, of this part of the treaty, infuriated Germany. And for the next 20 years, there'll be whole political movements based on one sole idea, anti-treaty of Versailles. And it didn't matter if they were socialist or they were fascist. They hated the Treaty of Versailles in Germany. And this would be a galvan galvanizing principle. And so here's a classic cartoon. I didn't show you this, did I? So here's Germany being led to the gallows by Lloyd George, Clemenceau, and Wilson. And here's another one of that starvation blockade. And you can see mother holding child and the whole idea of this is remember what happened to the children of Germany because of that blockade. That's what the Allies did to us. And this is going to have such a effect in Germany. And this was predicted by a few of the people at the treaty. A, a treaty this harsh in a modern world, especially a world now dominated by nationalism, will lead for a desire for revenge and the growth of ultra right wing parties. So here is a National Socialist cartoon breaking away from the Treaty of Versailles, breaking the chains in a new day. And Here's a British poster talking about the Treaty of Versailles was so strict it allowed for the growth of the Hitler party. Nonsense. And with the United States not involved in the post-war world, this will leave the United States in a position where we are just watching and not acting on the principles or the big events of the day. We are just observers and can do nothing. That is huge, a big effect. I just gave you a big effect of the treaty. Wow. I, just, I just give so many things. Moving on. What about all these new nations going to be created by the Treaty of Versailles? And self-determination. The people decide their own fate. It did not work at all. Multi-ethnic nations came out. Here are the multi-ethnic empires. Created multi-ethnic nations. It did not solve the problems of these different groups demanding independence. And those really have never been solved. And so you're going to have these weird combination states that are technically now these uh, ethnic states like Yugoslavia, state for the Slavs, yet there are many ethnic groups. It was barely kept together and would devolve into a bloody horrible civil war by 19, in the 1990s, an awful one. And Poland, this nation with the Poles, set in Wilson's 14 points. Well, Poland would be 60% ethnic Poles. And then there are the Germans, Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Czechs, um, uh, Croatians, a, the second largest population of Jews in the world, all there. This massive multi ethnic state. And you can see this area right here ethnic Germans, and Germans going to be very, Germany's going to be very very uh, resentful of this. What nation at this time had the largest population of Jews? Yeah, Soviet Union by far. Germany had a tiny population. And so it did not solve the problem. And so there's going to be fighting in Eastern Europe for years, potential for conflict. And so there was always this feeling, once again, we didn't solve the problems, there'll be another war. And what about the colonies? Well, the colonies would become mandates. German colonies would be mandates of the members of the League of Nations. They would administer them until they'd be ready to become countries. But what's going to happen is they're just going to become colonies now of the winning countries. So, for example, Southwest Africa became a colony of Britain. Southwest 
Southwest Africa, I'm sorry, Southeast Africa would be a colony of Britain, and they'd also carve off an area called Rwanda and Burundi and give it to Belgium. So they just start carving up the colonies just like they're they're carving up pieces in the empire for their for their plunder. Same thing with Cameroon, same thing with like Kaiser Wilhelm land became Papua New Guinea. Also the Middle East. Here is the huge Ottoman Empire. Now during the war, the British promised everybody or everybody who had an interest there something. So they'd help them with the war effort. They promised an Arab, national pan-Arab state. That didn't happen. They promised Zionist Jews a homeland vaguely here if they helped the, with the World War I out of war effort. And they're, they're very, there's some Jews, about 8% of the population of what is what was then, what's going to become the British colony of Palestine, or were Jewish. But they promised them that, so basically kick out the people who live there and become Jewish. And the British and French said, we're going to make our own colonies. Mandates. And that's what happened. So they created Yemen, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon, created by the French, and then this hodgepodge called Iraq would be created by the British. I should add, there's only one reason the British created Iraq, under one king. That's why they created it. There won't be anything down the road because of all these promises and deals made. Nothing to see here, move on. So the point is, they did not solve the problems. This was not self-determination. And this gets us to an important definition of foreign policy. Foreign policy is going to be kind of new then for the United States. You know, basic diplomacy, I know there are elements of it, but now the United States has to be involved in the international world. We fought this massive war now. And so there's two elements of foreign policy. And it's going to be... It, it's going to take the same names we have out of the economics, liberal and conservative. Liberal and conservative foreign policy. Now, these are not complete 100% absolute rules. It's just a basic idea of a couple different things. So liberal foreign policy believes the idea that this is a complex, nuanced world, and therefore we need diplomacy. And sometimes you're going to have to talk to people that might be their enemies. You must talk to them about, uh, to avoid wars to unify together for trade agreements or natural disasters or whatever it could be. So, so a more complex, nuanced world. Conservative economics is much different. Unlike this multi-nation diplomacy, it is very unilateral. It's us, and we decide what we do, and therefore the world is very simple. You're either with us or you're the enemy. It's good versus evil. And there is an appeal to this. This is hard especially when most Americans can't find countries on a map. And I'm saying that knowing my guess is most of you can't find most countries on a map. And you're very intelligent, smart, determined people. And you probably, if I gave you a blank map, could not identify most countries. A few of you could. I bet there's a few. In the U.S. from the Australian point of view. <laughs> and that doesn't mean you're dumb. It just means that the United States, for cultural reasons, does not know a lot about the world. So this is very appealing. The world's simple, isn't it? This will very much be Cold War policy. And boy, you'll see a lot of this after September 11, 2001. They attacked us because they hate us, not realizing the complexities of what's going on. Next, therefore, the United Liberal is more internationalist. They have a view where we have we have connections with the world, the outside world. We must make deals. We cannot be um, only isolated to what we're doing in the United States. And then conservatives is more isolationist. Isolationist, as in unit or unilateral. We must avoid foreign entanglement. But I put a question mark after both because it's always more complex than this. Those are isolationists might not, don't necessarily believe totally in isolation. It's not that they're not going to deal with other countries. They just have a different point of view. 
And liberal internationalists might look at internationalists, but they don't want war per se. You know, they'd be rapidly anti-war and want to do this to avoid war. Or there might be some are internationalists who say, let's go to war. So the point is, it is still a complex issue. But we have liberal versus conservative. And there can be people who are liberal foreign policy and conservative economically and vice versa. And these are not set rules. And once again, there'll be issues that you might say, oh, I, I, I want internationalists and we should must talk. And one, no, we can't talk. We can't trust them. I should add, this is a very stark decision today. So unless something radical happens, it's going to be President Biden's second term or the non-consecutive terms for President Trump. And one is very much here, and one is very much here. President Trump is very much isolationist, very much unilater or unilateral. And President Biden is very much pro-diplomacy, pro-international agreements, especially like military alliances like NATO, Biden is especially for. Trump uh, offhandedly commented that Russia should attack NATO members and the United States shouldn't do anything about our allies to protect them. So he's very isolationist. He, he says a lot of stuff. And so how much of that is uh, sincere? My assumption is you take it for the word, it's word, but you can really see that today. So these decisions exist. Remember what we do here. This is, it's not just, oh, that's interesting for 1919. It's today. So back to the treaty. The most important element of the treaty to President Wilson was the League of Nations. An international body where representatives from every country will come together. And how many countries were there? A lot. How many? About 30. Yeah. Only about 30 countries. And so most places will not be represented because they're colonies of imperial powers. But they would come together. Stop war before it happens. Is this liberal or conservative? Now, that's a very liberal idea. He did not invent it, but Wilson just became obsessed. But Wilson partially became obsessed because a lot of the negotiation was passing the bomb. He was in the middle of a horrible brain fog. What was the pandemic that hit? He got it. He got it. Didn't kill him, but it led to serious reduced cognitive functions. And with this new uh, kind of viruses like that, it leads to all kinds of different issues. There's also cardiovascular issues that came about because of this. And yes, COVID has almost exactly the same thing, even though it's a different virus. It's interesting how new viruses affect people uh, until immunity begin to develop. But back to this. The most controversial part was Article 10. Now, in the actual treaty, they go Roman numerals, but you'll see them write it out as 10 because people might not know it's Roman numerals. I'm putting Roman numerals down. We, all, we should do all our math in Roman numerals. Who's agree? I think an easy calculus would be a common oh, numeral. There's a reason that we're sitting here. The yeah, Romans hardly did anything. <laughs> so, collective security. And what that meant is this all the member nations would be united to stop aggression. Basically, this content. If one member nation is attacked, all the, by an aggressive nation attacks a member of the League of Nations, all the other members of the League of Nations will rally together to stop them. Now, this might appear like, especially when we think about the history of the world, oh, we'll be at war all the time. No, this was meant to deter aggression. If every, if people are worried about going to war, if they're worried about going to war, if they go to war, everybody will attack them. No pull out. And this is the way to stop it before it happens. And here is Wilson. And it's the rear view showing it's kind of a combination of mocking the League of Nations, but also supporting it. It's really complex. But here are the member nations, and they're all heavily armed, ready to go to war. But the League of Nations will keep them in a choir singing everlasting peace so they don't go off and shoot each other. And that's Wilson. And so that is a liberal idea that we can deter war before it happens. Who would be crazy enough to challenge the rest of the world? That's the idea. Now, the problem is... 
who is willing in this class to right now go fight and die for, let me just throw a country out of here for no reason at all, Czechoslovakia. Anybody want to go, anybody want to take a bullet in their face for Czechoslovakia? No, I'm serious. I said it should be Anybody know why I say Czechoslovakia? Because took Czechoslovakia in 1938, and their allies, Britain and France, did not. Same thing would happen in Hungary in 1956. The U.S. would encourage them to rebel against their Soviet-dominated government, and then the U.S. sat back and let them be crushed. Why? We didn't want World War III and blow the world up over Hungary. Do you see a problem with this? There's a big problem with this. And so conservatives jumped on this right away. And they said these basic ideas. First off, conservative reaction. The Constitution says there has to be a declaration of war by Congress. Everyone got that? The Constitution, declaration of war by Congress. This implies just war without declaration of war. And secondly, are we going to be forced into wars all over the world to fight for others? I mean, you look at the history of the world, there seems to be wars everywhere. And then everywhere? I mean, are we going to go to... We just fought in Europe. Does this mean now Africa, Asia, South America, the Pacific Ocean, Oceania, everywhere? We're going to be fighting wars, wars forever. And don't forget, Congress declares war. They're saying it's our constitutional duty. Gee, these would be kind of big deals to have on, a, on an essay about ratification of the Treaty of Versailles, wouldn't it? I'm sure there's nothing here to see. Moving on. When's the last time we declared war? United States. World War II. United States. So basically, Congress has given up their constitutional duty anyways. But this is their reaction. So more liberal, more conservative. And you can see the arguments in both, can't you? You might be leaning one way or the other, but this is problematic. And so... When Wilson snuck out in the middle of the night and brought this treaty back to the United States, nobody was happy. And one more thing I have to add, the economy was in a depression. And so Wilson was unpopular because of that. And he was gone for six months. And it was like, you're finally back? So Wilson arrived. And remember, it requires two-thirds of the Senate with a Republican majority. And immediately, Congress divided up into three groups. Loyal Democrats. Loyal Democrats, that will be mostly liberal or, pre or Democrats that feel basically they, they owe it to President Wilson. They're tied to President Wilson. They don't want the wrath of President Wilson. So they're going to vote for the treaty as is. Next, reservations. These are mostly Republicans. There were a few Democratic reservationists. And they like part of the treaty. So they are kind of liberal, fairly, but they hate Article 10, despise Article 10. So they want to go back through and rewrite Article 10 so it does not force the United States into conflicts it doesn't want. And then, of course, irreconcilable. Oh, I'm sorry, the leader, Henry Cabot Lodge who, remember, was furious because he was not invited to the treaty negotiations. He was furious. Here is Lodge escorting the battered treaty with reservations one last time. And then, of course, irreconcilables. These are conservatives, mostly Republicans, but a significant number of Democrats, too. They're conservative. They're opposed to the treaty. They will not vote for it. And so this is the problem Wilson has. How do you get a treaty through Congress if the biggest group in Congress want changes? So I didn't try to write this down, so write this. Wilson refused to make compromises. He had one good reason, but also Wilson thought he was on the side of the angels. And if he agreed with them, it must be like a holy script, holy writ, and come down to him from the heavens. He did, did not want to change. He didn't want to admit the mistakes they made and come to the idea that we just have the League of Nations and solve everything. But there's also one more reason. 
any changes would have to go back to Britain and France. Now, so Wilson did a different tactic. He campaigned around the country in states where they had senators who are reservations. So he campaigned in reservationist states. He went to their states and tried to get the public behind the treaty. So here he is in Seattle. He would give these speeches to try, he went to Montana, Montana had reservations, to try to convince reservationists to agree to his treaty. Now, two things before you write down stroke. How do you suppose the reservation that senators felt about this? They were furious. They were already mad at Wilson. How dare they come into their state and campaign against him? Especially the Republicans who are like, what are you doing? You're in the different party. And then in Denver, he had a horrible stroke. It was probably his third stroke. What caused the stroke? Almost certainly the flu. Just like there's a significant number of cardiovascular issues because of COVID, it was even a little bit worse then. And this stroke, we don't know how incapacitated he was, but what was the medical treatment for stroke back in 1919? I hope you get better. It was slightly more than that, but that was, you know, they couldn't do much. And today it's still very difficult, they don't catch it early. But he couldn't talk, he couldn't communicate. We don't know how long. But here's the biggie. After the stroke, they kept this secret, the White House, especially his new wife, his first wife passed away, he got married while president. His new wife kept this secret. So they kept him bedridden in the White House after this for over six months, all through the negotiation. And why this is important is here's Wilson, no compromise, no compromise, won't change, won't change, no stroke hit. And that's frozen in time. From that moment on, his wife and the few advisors who, who were kind of in the inner circle, they didn't allow any deviation from Wilson's last position. Has everyone got that? No deviations. So even some loyal Democrats who would have voted for the ones with reservation, it's felt tied to this. And so there would be three votes. The first with reservations, that was Lodge's vote. But irreconcilables and loyal Democrats all voted against it. It did not get a majority, let alone the two thirds. Next, Wilson's won, no change to the treaty. All irreconcilables and every reservationist voted against it. Lodge rallied support, angry at Wilson, furious at Wilson. And because they kept Wilson hidden away, that made them even more angry and resentful. And then lastly, one more vote. And there was a hint that Wilson might allow changes, but the last minute through his wife, we don't know what Wilson could say yet. He wouldn't release his, his loyal Democrats. A few did vote for it, but it did not pass. It got a majority. So it was close, but not to two thirds. Irreconcilables and most loyal Democrats voted against it. Yeah, voted against it. I should have more clear on that, but. Are you <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, basically, um, they, they went and begged through its wife, begged him to say, let us vote our conscience on this treaty and and no rep, um, no kind of punishment from the White House. But, you know, the president has a lot of, of power. And so they didn't want to be on Wilson's bad side. But it came back through from Wilson's wife. No, Wilson will not allow you to and vote your conscience. Now, some did but most did not. And so that's really, was it, you know, there's a lot of opposition to the treaty, but if Wilson would have made the changes, could have passed, and I think there's a very good chance. Obviously, we'll never know. But here's a great cartoon. Now, let's look at this cartoon carefully, shall we? Oh, by the way, is this liberal or conservative cartoon? So let's look. It's a way. Here's the League of Nations. The League of Nations was part of the Treaty of Versailles. 
It was not separate. It was part of the treaty. So peace negotiation. So it's marrying foreign entanglements to Uncle Sam. By the way, just simply using the word entanglement, would that be a conservative idea of foreign policy or liberal? Very conservative, like you're tied in a knot because of this. And it's a wedding then. And it says, if any man can show just cause why they must not lawfully be joined together, let him now speak. And here comes the Senate, the stop it. And he's carrying, it says, constitutional rights. Is this conservative or liberal? Is this, so it's anti-treaty. Is this reservationist or is this irreconcilable? Yeah. It's definitely more irreconcilable, isn't it? I mean, you might see a little bit of reservation and saying, stop it, let's make changes, but it seems to be totally against it. That's a good cartoon. Clever one. I wonder if we'll ever see that one again. So, it's not ratified. They literally call the mood of the United States isolationitis, like a disease. Hey, you just, the plague is, there's a new plague going on that time. Everyone's talking about it. And, therefore, the United States would not be part of the treaty. I'll explain those four nations in a second, okay? So don't worry about that. But, here, oh, let's, here we have a cartoon then. And basically, the gap in the bridge. So the bridge of potential enemies together, like the foundation of world peace. Just think about like a bridge. And here we have the four main powers that won the war. Belgium, France, England, and Italy. And yet the keystone piece is sitting off to the side. Therefore, this will crumble and world peace will crumble. But what's the keystone state? All roads lead to Nebraska, Pennsylvania. Here, the ship of state, the United States, going through dangerous iceberg filled waters. Treaty with Britain and France, foreign entanglements, foreign treaties, League of Nations. So it might get stuck on a crash on any one of those. Is this liberal or conservative? This could liberal or conservative? Liberal or conservative? Much more liberal. So the United States was out of the loop then. Even though we did get involved with international efforts to try to limit arms in the 1920s, we're still out of it. And one more thing, in the 1930s, in the wake of the horrific Great Depression, when Japan took Manchuria and off in 31 and China in 30, and attacked China in 37, the League of Nations could do nothing. And part of the reason the United States was not involved. When Italy attacked Ethiopia, the League of Nations could do nothing. When Germany attacked Czechoslovakia, or took Czechoslovakia, if that's the wrong word, the League of Nations by then was so weak, it couldn't stop it, and Germany would be emboldened to do more. Yeah. Yeah. It was already, you know, twice that had this huge Yeah, it's only eight years or nine years after that. Not nine years, well, let's say seven years. And did everyone catch this? What do we have to do for context? Don't you have to put down like what came out of this? Oh, what did I just do for you? And by the way, if you just wrote down Ethiopia and go back, will you know what you mean? I will know, but that's, that really doesn't affect you. I know lots of stuff. I know you do too. So you have to prove it on this test. So part of the issue that happened but there was a post-war depression, so Wilson's standing. Presidents are always blamed. Probably more, they probably get more blame and sometimes more credit than they deserve for the, for the economy. They got rid of the army. There's demobilization. The army is shrunk now. Four million men in uniform overnight, they went back down to 100,000 man army. Overnight. So all of a sudden you have millions of men who came home without a job. They gave them a suit and $100 and said, good luck. The New Deal under Roosevelt, they would do much better for veterans, but even then it still was horrible. And all the factories, they had retooled their, their machines, their machine tools to make military weapons. Now they got to go back to consumer goods. It's going to take six to eight months to start making cars. And prices are going to keep going up. Inflation, because there's a shortage of consumer goods, kept going up and wages are not keeping up. 
here is the dip in the economy. There was a massive economic depression. So you ever get that concept? Any cars out there then are going to be a higher price because they're not making new cars until 1920, 21. And if they're not making new cars, that means they don't need those workers that would have worked in the factory because not all of them will be retooling. So what happens? You're going to have, and right down for demobilization, an increase in unemployment. And I should add, I understand we just had daylight savings time. But toughen up, people. Everybody is, is droopy after daylight savings time. This lasts about a week. And you, your, your sleep is all messed up. Toughen up, people. Huh? I don't think there is. Either go back in the, in the 1970s, early 1970s, 1974, they made daylight savings time come year around. And for two months of the year, it was pitch black in, in schools. Kids had to walk to school in pitch black all over the United States. And it was chaos. They got rid of it in two months. I live through it. Car crashes increase every year by twice the central numbers around the cities. Okay, so back to this. So what happened was this massive depression hit. Oh, so does everyone get one thing, that key element about this? So put in italics. Why? Because there was a shortage. Low supply of consumer goods. So prices skyrocketed and no one could afford it. Gee, I wonder if that's happened any time where you might have all of a sudden a cut in production and supply went down and prices went up. Could that have happened? Just I'm just throwing some time out here. 2021, no. 2022, COVID and the effects of that were similar, fortunately not as bad, but similar to this. And just as people like, oh, why doesn't the president do something? They said the same thing then. When this is what happens after war or pandemics. So, oh, and I should add, don't forget one other thing. We just had a pandemic in 1919. So the pandemic did the same thing in 1919 that happened to us in 2021. It was a double whammy of pandemic and demobilization after the war. A double whammy. It really hit the economy. Everyone kind of forgot about that. I'm just always shocked how people forgot about 2020. They did it then too. Yeah. What was the range between the Great Depression year-wise? 1919 and 1921. Just like now, we are. I mean, the economy is kind of booming, but we still kind of feel like it's because the prices are so high because prices just don't go down. It's just not the way the economy works. If prices start going down, that means we're in a depression. We don't. We don't want that. Which would be fun, though. A depression would be fun for you guys just when you start entering the work world. <laughs> we don't want that. <laughs> so, nationwide, then, this is going to trigger a series of strikes. Everyone got this? Now, during the war, wages did not keep up with it, but workers were like, I'll make the sacrifice for the war. I'll make the sacrifice. But in 1919, nationwide strikes. It started in two areas on each coast. It was a police strike in Boston. Police officers in Boston were, uh, their pay had not gone up since 1917. So they were suffering. And longshoremen in Seattle went on strike. And when longshoremen went on strike, this is going to trigger nationwide strikes, starting with longshoremen. Hey, what's a longshoreman? You would know? Longshoreman? Longshoremen are, are the men and women who run long ships. Yeah. Longshoremen. Now, I know, hey, you guys should know this. Helena is a major port and shipping center. No, but it's one, that's longshoremen. We don't have as many now as there used to be because of mechanization, but there used to be thousands of them. And it soon spread nationwide. The biggest would be the horribly mistreated coal miners of West Virginia. They called it the coal miner ones. And I should add, all of these strikes would be brutally put down by the government. 
National Guardsmen and sometimes troops, brutally put down and destroyed. The Maywan massacre was a massacre of coal miners. An incredible time, but all this happened after the war. What was the strike way back in 1894? Yeah, the Pullman strike. Remember that happened during the Panic of 1893? And people thought that might lead to a revolution? Well, they felt the same here. Oh, and then one more thing happened. There was a series of anarchists. That, in fact, the last wave of anarchist attacks in American history, well, into the 1970s. 1970s were the, the most terrorist attacks in American history in the 70s, by far. So there were over 50 bombings, most of them mail bombs, including the attorney general. Here's the attorney general Palmer's house was bombed. He was not killed, it was a mail bomb, but he was wounded. And the biggest would be in 1920, and actually this would be like the last anarchist bombing. Anarchist bombing um, just ended. But right in front of Wall Street, a bomb hidden in a carriage killed 88, 38 people and wounded over 200. And so think about you have strikes and anarchist attacks all of a sudden at once, just as Wilson's trying to get this treaty ratified. That's part of the anger against Wilson. But I should add, people blamed the war for all this. Hey, if the war caused this, let's not have another war. No treaty. No war. I'm sorry, no treaty means no more war. Obviously, that's not going to happen. And so here's the deal. These strikes are bombings. Is this workers' rights? Was this the beginning of a revolution? Now, let me ask you this. It could be a combination. It could be pure workers' rights. That's a question that's really hard to define. But if you're sitting there after a year, after a year and a half of total war, remember total war? Remember that? Kind of a big deal. You're looking out for enemies and those who are against the war. Could there have been a revolution that might have shook the United States to its core? I can't think of any. I'm just kind of looking at this flag for no reason at all. I just, I just decided to look at a flag. Can anyone guess why I'm looking at this flag? Because it's red. Huh? There was a Soviet revolution. Socialists were against the coming to it. Socialists were against the war. Remember total war? You root out the enemies of the war effort, including socialists. And you can't just all of a sudden say when the war ended, all right, now we're all friends. No, it lingers and lingers. It's no coincidence after both world wars would be a red scare. The rooting out of enemies, it does not end when the fighting ends. And so there became anti-socialist reaction to this. Socialists must be triggering this. Maybe it's communist agents. Maybe Bolsheviks are right here on the shore. Here are Bolsheviks. Bolshevism, turning back the clock of civilization. And here is a cry for Uncle Sam to do something about union labor. By the way, would this be more conservative or liberal of a cartoon? Very conservative. Attacking unions. And that's going to trigger the Red Scare. The rooting out of communists. It will also be known as the Palmer Raids because a now injured Attorney General Palmer will use the force of the United States government to root out enemies of the state. But where are the enemies of the state? Well, labor unions. So they destroyed labor unions, especially the IWW. They destroyed them. Whoops. By claiming they're communist guerrillas. In fact, they deported to Russia the leaders of the IWW. They just kicked them out of the country. These were American citizens. They ran them out of the country. The leader of the IWW was Big Bill Hayward. And he just they sent them to Petrograd. International workers of the world, but they were known as the Wobblies. They're the ones that had Frank Little and Butte. And so here's a cartoon, American institutions. It's actually from an animated cartoon. We'll see it on Friday. And it's crushing out Bolshevism, and it was made by Henry Ford, his company anti-union and they just went after arrested oh what 
law did they use to arrest members of labor unions? The Espionage Act. And the war is over. But is it really? The Red Scare will happen after both wars. Also, it's kind of interesting it's going to happen. You have propaganda in the war. And then you and you have then the Red Scare afterwards. And one other thing, two other things I guess you can say. The first golden age of advertising would come after World War I. Well, those men who sold the war started selling cars. And then after World War II, they started selling television sets. One of those amazing quirks. Are we done here? Uh, write down Great Migration and then we'll finish this. Oh, so I got good news for all of you. So one class of mine, for reasons that are not mine, and it's not theirs either, are day behind. So I gave you the documents. If you have any questions, you can ask tomorrow. We're going to write them in class on this. They are going to have to hustle up. You guys. You guys want to do it tomorrow? Yeah. How about we do it then? Write, take, write two DBQs tonight at home. Write one in one position, one the other. Sound good? I'm kidding. We'll do it Thursday. So read through the documents. Any questions, I'll ask. Sound good? Yeah, as long as you use evidence from the document and your own knowledge. But if you disagree with me, I'll say no, 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 no. If you disagree with me, though, no. Either side, and the thing about it is, is that there's arguments on both sides. Okay. Yeah. You do it on I know what to do about what's that thing more. I know it will be more. Okay. And, so I like the the and that's a problem. Even if you're being arrested and stuff, you're still not doing the class. And there's always arguments about that. Yeah, I know, right? I I stand with ice cream. I'm just happy to mess with my cup. Oh yeah, he's he's getting the message. Oh, okay. so you got to have the baseball something. I think he fell downstairs. If you're not here, you'll make it up. I'll call him. I'll call him in the cell. How? I think my. I think. He's but he's okay. Yeah, he just like fell downstairs. Ouch. You have to give it back. Oh, there's there's a pen. Use that. Oh, cool. yeah, there's so there's someone there. forgot their pen. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I have uh, one for the silverware and it's got illustrations. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. Oh, I'm so glad I told you. Oh, there's no? What? You're a senior. It's always funny at graduation that people didn't iron their gowns and they're just these wrinkles blocking it. It's just hilarious <laughs> and sad, you know, because they're really embarrassed. Yeah. Alright. Yeah, What's your shirt? Um, something I like. The 11th Airborne Division. Yada. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here? I am here. No, uh, it was thing. My mother-in-law that might have been a 
medical thing. It turned out not to happen. So I'm here. Which is good. I don't think you have that skill set.